I do research in breath testing. Now, when I tell people that, I generally get a response like, oh, that's like uh, when the police stop you by the side of the road just to see if you're driving drunk or not. That's when I have to explain to them, well, you know, breath tests are not just for alcohol anymore. Physicians, like myself, know that you can tell a tremendous amount from the breath about health and disease. In fact, we've known it for thousands of years. If you go back to the 5th century BC, Hippocrates, the father of medicine, told his students, smell your patient's breath. Terrific advice, even now in the 21st century. You can tell a tremendous amount from smelling a person's breath. For instance, people with diabetes, they've got a fruity smell in their breath. It's a bit like rotten apples. It's mainly because of the acetone in their breath. Patients with kidney failure, their breath smells like urine. People with liver failure have this wonderful expression, fetor hepaticus, the stench of the liver. It's mainly because of the sulfur compounds in their breath. People with a lung abscess, they've got a sewer-like smell in their breath. They smell like sewers for the same reason that sewers smell like sewers, because of the proliferation of anaerobic bacteria. And finally, nutrient recognition. All of you can tell if your friends have had any alcohol or garlic for breakfast. Fast forward 2,000 years. France in the late 1700s. Lavoisier, the father of chemistry, did this first experiment measuring chemicals in the breath. On the left standing, you can see Monsieur Lavoisier standing and supervising the experiment. On the right, Madame Lavoisier is seated, writing it all for posterity. On the left foreground, his very unfortunate subject, stripped to the waist, is huffing and puffing through a large container of lime water, calcium hydroxide. After he's been puffing away for several minutes, they saw a fine, milky white precipitate appear, calcium bicarbonate. This was the first evidence that human beings excrete carbon dioxide in the breath. Well, nowadays, of course, kids do it in grade school, no big deal. But back in the late 1700s, this was an amazing discovery because it showed that we humans, we take in food and we burn it, rather like a log of wood burning in a fireplace and we generate carbon dioxide. This is the basis of all of our understanding of metabolism and all the understanding that has led to modern biochemistry. Unfortunately, it did not do Lavoisier much good. He had his head cut off in the French Revolution. This had nothing to do with breath testing. That was because of his day job as a tax collector. Fast forward another 200 years, the United States, Linus Pauling in the 1970s. Linus Pauling was an amazing man. He got the Nobel Prize twice. And in addition to that, he invented what we can now recognize as the first micro-analysis of human breath. He got one of his luckless graduate students to breathe into a coal trap, and he froze the breath. And then he injected it into what was then a new technology, gas chromatography. And to Pauling's amazement, and to everybody's amazement, he found that human beings have several hundred compounds in their breath all in very low concentrations, maybe down there in parts per billion. Well, all of us now who are doing any work in breath testing are standing on the shoulders of giants. The first giant is Hippocrates, who taught us that breath contains clues to disease. The second giant, Lavoisier, showed us that we can analyze these compounds chemically. And the third giant, Linus Pauling, showed that with the right technology, we can detect several hundred different compounds. I was bitten by this bug some years ago, and I thought, well, you know, maybe we can find clues to disease in breath. So, first of all, we started off developing our own technology, and this was the state of the art in 1992. Note the refined elegance of the instruments we were using. However, we learned a lot from these first crude experiments. We learned that you had to have absolutely meticulous technology so as to avoid it being contaminated. We also then worked on it for a few more years, and around about the year 2000, we got it into a neat little box, a breath collecting apparatus, which is actually a pump controlled by microprocessors. It's got a little digital window on the front, and it leads the user step by step in how to collect a breath sample. It's very user friendly and very patient friendly. This is how it works in practice. This young lady here, she's wearing a nose clip, and she's breathing in and out through a disposable mouthpiece. Now, you can see that little tube at the end of the big tube. That is what we call a sorbent trap. 
It looks like a cup, it looks like a cigarette made out of stainless steel. It's packed with very, very pure activated charcoal. And it collects all the volatiles. So that after she's been breathing through that system for two minutes, we have collected all of the volatiles in one liter of breath. Then the machine gives a beep, switches over, and collects a separate sample of room air onto a separate set trap. The reason we do that is that this method is so incredibly sensitive down to parts per billion and parts per trillion, we have to collect the room air volatiles as well and subtract it from the breath signal. Now, when we do that, we then analyze it in the lab with a rather amazing machine. It is called two-dimensional gas chromatography with time-of-flight mass spectrometry. See that great big forest of peaks out there? Every one of those peaks represents a different chemical compound. And we can actually identify those chemical compounds by using a computer-based library. And so we know what they are. And using this method, we can now detect approximately 2,000 different compounds. So this is really quite remarkable. 2,000 compounds. You think about it. Every one of you know, every time you breathe out, 2,000 compounds are coming out, maybe more. Well, we've been using this technology for detecting diseases. And we now know that we can detect several diseases. And we published it. Diseases like lung cancer, breast cancer, tuberculosis, influenza, radiation exposure. We can detect all of these conditions with accuracy between 80 to 90 percent. Now, some of you might be thinking, oh, 80 to 90 percent? Why not 100 percent? Well, I've got to tell you, very few tests in medicine are 100 percent accurate. In fact, those of them that we use very routinely, for instance, like a mammogram, way worse. They've only got accuracy about 74% for a film mammogram or 78% for a digital mammogram. So what does this all mean for the practice of medicine? Let me give you an example of how a physician diagnoses breast cancer. It's like climbing up a ladder. The physician starts on that lowest rung of the ladder with a test that is the least invasive, least expensive, least dangerous. If it's positive, say in the case of a mammogram, then it goes up to the next rung onto the ladder, which might be uh, imaging with a sonogram. And if that's positive, up to the top of the ladder with a biopsy, which is the gold standard. Now, where does breath testing fit into this? I see breath testing taking the role of the lowest rung on the ladder. It's going to be the first test that we can do in order to see if a person does not have a disease, which you call a rule out test. And we can say with better than 99% certainty that if the breath test is negative, then you do not have that disease and you do not have to go on and have a mammogram. Now, for the men in the audience, I need to remind you, having a mammogram is not fun. It requires compressing the breast between two metal plates, which is painful, and also exposing the breast to the amount of radiation, which is potentially hazardous as well. So if we can reduce the number of mammograms that need to be done every year and still not lose any more women to breast cancer, then we've done patients a service. Thank you. Where does this fit in with the practice of medicine? Well, historically, medical tests or diagnostic tests go through three stages in their evolution. They start out as a lab test, goes on to become a point of care test, and finally becomes a personal test. A good example of this is pregnancy testing. Now, pregnancy testing went through some interesting evolutions. It started out in the 1920s with the famous ashheim zondek test. This means that a woman collected a, a sample of urine, gave it to the physician, uh, and injected it then into a rat or a rabbit. A few days later, they killed the animal, autopsied it, looked at the ovaries, and said, aha, pregnant or not. Terrible test. Time-consuming, expensive, and it wasn't all that accurate. But that's all there was until the 1960s, when the first immunologic test came in, and then a woman could go to a doctor's office, collect a sample of urine, and within a few minutes in the doctor's office be tested for pregnancy, positive or negative. Then, in the 1970s, FDA approved the first home test, which means that any woman now can go to a drugstore and for less than $10 buy herself a fantastically accurate test and test herself in the privacy of her own home. Now, I see breath testing as going through exactly the same course of development. We're going to start out with these biomarker discoveries using the laboratory-based test, which picks up about 2,000 different compounds. 
But we don't need all 2,000 of those compounds to diagnose a disease. We might only need, say, 10 or so of them to diagnose lung cancer. And we can detect those uh, volatiles with a much simpler, cheaper instrument right there at the point of care. Eventually, we hope to get to a personal test, put it into the cell phone. We're not quite there yet. Let me show you what the point of care test looks like. We developed a device, we call it the breath link system. And you can see carried inside that blue cart, there's a little device there, actually it's two boxes. This is a small point of care gas chromatogram. Patient breathes into that long tube for two minutes, we analyze it, we get an analysis within six minutes. Now, we've been using this anywhere in the world, many sites around the world. If you go to the far left of this, you'll see that the person breathes into the box on the uh, left-hand side. We upload the data through the internet, download it to our lab, we interpret it with an algorithm, generate a report, and send it back to the point of care. And we can close that loop in less than 10 minutes. We did this with a study of patients with uh, active pulmonary tuberculosis. You can see from this map that Newark, New Jersey is the center of the world. And <laughs> we <laughs> were connected to sites in the Philippines, two sites in the Philippines, one in London, England, and one in Mumbai, India. The patient would just breathe into the machine in Mumbai, India. Two minutes later, we're seeing that breath chromatogram in our lab here in Newark. Now, this was a remarkable test. And we found that the six-minute breath test was highly accurate. It detected active pulmonary tuberculosis. It could potentially slash the costs of finding cases of tuberculosis in the developing world and maybe save a lot of lives. And we now have new clinical evidence that it works for breast cancer as well. Now, what about the last one on the list, the personal test at the point of care? But I mean the personal test that you can put in your pocket as a cell phone. We're not there yet. Almost, though. If you go to Korea, you can buy a cell phone which is going to measure the amount of alcohol in your breath. You, some people are actually also trying to develop tests so that they can detect bad breath. I've got to tell you, alcohol, easy. People put out tons of it in their breath. Bad breath, easy. You can smell somebody on the other side of the room. Disease, difficult. Because now you've got to start detecting these compounds in parts per billion or parts per trillion. So I think the breath test of the future is going to look something like this. It's going to be a cell phone. It collects breath. It concentrates it. It analyzes it. It transmits the data to a central computer. We then analyze that data with an algorithm and send the diagnosis back by, lung, uh, by uh, voicemail. Think that sounds like science fiction? I've got to tell you, we can do all of that today with one exception. That is the analysis. Analysis is the missing link. We do not yet have a sufficiently sensitive analytic method that will fit inside a cell phone. Now, I've got to tell you, we're looking very hard, and so are lots of other people. There are all kinds of candidate technologies out there. For example, this little device there is really the size of a quarter. This is what's called a microfabricated gas chromatograph. That could do the job as well, but it needs a gas supply. It chews up lots of energy. You can't get shoehorn it into a cell phone. But look, we're getting closer and closer all the time. So I want you to join me in gazing into the future. Where are breath tests going? Let's look into our crystal ball. I believe the time is coming, not very far distant, when we can do breath tests on anybody, anywhere, at any time. It might look something like this. Welcome to your telephone breath diagnostic service. Please test the test you require from the following menu. At the sound of the beep, Take in a deep breath, and then breathe all the way out. The news will not always be good. Your telephone breath test indicates a high risk for lung cancer. <laughs> Press 1 if you wish to speak with a counselor. <laughs> Sometimes the news will be mixed. Your breath test is positive, uh, negative for breast cancer, positive for pregnancy. Press 1 if you wish to speak to a counselor. Meanwhile, out in the desert somewhere, your breath test indicates dehydration and hypothermia. Drink one liter of water immediately. So I hope you will agree with me that this is indeed breathtaking technology. <laughs> Thanks for listening.